The Small Business Show, episode 219 for Wednesday, April 17th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to The Small Business Show here at businessshow.co, the show that is by, for, and about small business. Our sponsor for this episode is the Alternative Board at thealternativeboard.com slash SBS. We'll talk more about that later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And out on the West Coast, I'm Shannon Jean. How are you, sir? I am good, Mr. Jean. How are you? <laughs> I am good. I'm good. I don't know that I've ever hey, called you that before, but you know, I don't think go. so. Yeah. That's my father. So, you know, <laughs> <Exactly>. but that's <it's> okay. <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, hey, uh, I want to jump right into a, a topic today. You know, we, we talk a lot about adversity. We've had some great guests recently talking about powering through things and, and even, you know, just starting a business on your own, creating revenue streams, trying to build wealth. We talk about that stuff all the time and how difficult it can be. Super rewarding. You know, if you do it right, you get to live the charmed life that we talk about. Um, but, you know, you're often trying to figure out where to start, where to focus your energy, how to develop a system based approach to get what you want. And we've been looking at things and sometimes having a coach provide you with some guidance is just what you need. And today we're really happy. We're joined uh, by Monica Shaw, founder of Revenue Breakthrough. Uh, Revenue Breakthrough is a coaching and training resource that helps our clients get through many of the obstacles they face to achieve success. Thank you for coming on the show today, Monica. We really appreciate it. I'm super excited to be here. That's great. It's awesome. So tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about uh Revenue breakthrough, what you do and what your team does, but also, you know, how you got started and why you decided to uh, uh, launch the business. Sure. I Revenue Breakthrough is I'm a business coaching company. And what that means is that I help my focus is on helping entrepreneurs make more money. And I do that. My I, I, I like to try to I like to help them be able to double or triple their incomes within 12 to 18 months of working with me. And what I do is I teach um, money mindset skills, sales skills, and marketing skills to make sure that we can get more leads and more money. And what's interesting about this is that I have found when I started my company, my I've been doing this for over 15 years. And uh, when I started my very first company, I had just graduated uh, from the Kellogg School of Management, I had my MBA, and um, that's the business school at Northwestern. And then I went to L'Oreal Paris, and I was a brand manager for L'Oreal Paris. And I left out to start my own company, and I honestly thought that I was hot shit. I did. I thought, oh, I've got the MBA, <laughs> I've got the marketing experience, like I can do this. Yeah, what What else do you need? That's right. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly, right. And I, you know, I bet you there's a lot of listeners out there who you 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 think you're really good because you are able to sell for other people. You're able to like create success for someone else, and then you start to do it for yourself, and you're like different ballgame. And for me, within 12 months of leaping out and starting my own business, I was $25,000 in debt. And I wasn't worried so much about the debt because you need money to come from somewhere to start a business. So debt itself isn't a horrible thing. We all are going to need to get loans or credit card debt or or family money or something to help us like sort of take that leap. My issue was that I didn't know how to pay the debt off. And I just kept growing and growing. And as someone, and I always say this to people who are, you know, if you've had previous success, you consider yourself to be at a certain bar. Um, and here I was trying to like figure out how I was going to pay, make money in my business and it just wasn't happening. And so I did everything I could to make money in New York City. I walked dogs, I cat sitted, I rented my apartment out, I sold things on eBay. Like I tried to do what every like, I think startup entrepreneur does, which is like you try to cut all your expenses and make a ton of money to just try to survive. And there was a particular day where I had uh, rented my apartment out for seven days in a row, slept on someone's couch and then someone else's couch and then someone's floor. And I got all my bags and got on the subway and I got out of the subway. It was the 60 BDFQ stop. And I had two bags on one hand on one shoulder 
two bags on another shoulder, a bag across my chest, and then a roller bag that I was carrying in my right hand. And I started walking up the subway stairs. (laughs) (laughs) And as you can imagine, the New Yorkers are so nice. And they're like running by me and knocking my bags off. And I get to the top of the stairs and I look to the left of the sub and the escalators closed. And I look to the right and the elevator's closed. And I look in front of me and there's three more flights of stairs to get to street level. Oh, wow. And at that moment, I just got really tired. And I sat my bags down and I could kind of, and I could feel the tears starting to come. And then I did what in New York is the unthinkable, which is that I sat down on the New York subway floor. <laughs> Whoa. Well, yeah, that's, that's a, if you, if you haven't spent any time in the New York subways, you might not understand the the gravity of yeah. what, what Monica just described, but yes, <laughs> this is, this is a, this is a moment that will live with you forever. That's right. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. It is. You, I always say, you know, you know, you've hit rock bottom when you sit down on a New York subway floor yes. and, <laughs> Uh, and it's so funny because people were walking by me and they're trying, they're trying to do that thing that we all do, which is we stare straight at someone when we're trying to look away no, no, um, and they're all wondering what's going on. And I you know, could just feel myself giving up in that moment. And I got really clear that I had to figure out how I was going to generate money. And I was, and how I, and I gave myself 12 months to figure it out um, and get clear before I, I decided I would go back and get a job. And I hired, what I did in that time is I picked myself a business coach, a marketing expert. I went back, I talked to my friends from business school. I talked to my dad who sold his company in college. And what I got really clear on is that as entrepreneurs, we do a lot of stuff. But what we do are the activities that actually generate money. We spend a lot of our days just filling our time, but we're not actually doing revenue generating activities. And therefore, most entrepreneurs I know and myself at that point were working twice as hard as they, as they need to be. And I was making half as much money as I could be. And for me, what I got really clear on is there are very clear steps to make money in business. And if you're not doing those steps, you can be working all day long and you're going to continue to struggle and continue to hit walls um, year after year, month after month in your business about not having enough. And I know for me, when I finally figured out like what I needed to do to consistently generate money, it changed everything. I was able to pay back that $25,000 within 12 months. I started being able to put money into safe accounts. And then within years, I grew my revenue every single year and I crossed the seven figure mark. And today we help other entrepreneurs do the same, like really figure out the money piece. Because I believe that there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there who are just, whether we openly admit it or not, money is a taboo that we do not discuss. And for the most part, um, we're just struggling around it. And, And what I know to be true is that if we can just get enough money into the hands of the right people, this world is going to look like a different place. And that's my mission on the planet now. That's awesome. I, I commend you for getting up off the floor. You know, that <laughs> that is, well, you know, it, it's just a great metaphor as well. And obviously it stuck with you, but is the, it's that, okay, now I've got to change, you know, this is not working, got to come up with something new and uh, getting up and just moving. It's it's often the hardest, you know, thing that all of us do. So yeah, yeah. momentum is easy to keep going. Well, yeah. easier than starting it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. No, that's that's great. And and it's a great story. And I, and I love the the motivation part. And so, you know, and, and we agree, we, we love this uh, concept of coaching and mentoring here, because we've had it, you know, we've done that with uh, people and we've done it for people. Um, can you give me some, you know, what do people look for? What should they be looking for when seeking out a resource like, you know, a, a coaching business like yourself? Uh, what they need to watch out for? I, I, a couple of things. I think uh, when you're looking for um, a, a mentor or a coach, you want to make sure that that person is well ahead of where you want to be. Um, uh, ideally, you want that person to be, you know, metaphorically 50 to 100 steps beyond where you want to be. Uh, so at, when you're looking at them, you want to evaluate, like, if I want to make um, – you know, a hundred thousand in my business, you want that coach to be making well above that. If you want to make a million in your business, you want that coach to be above that. And the reason for that is because you want them to have had the experience of 
going through what you're about to go through and falling on their face <laughs> sure. um, and figuring it out and, and being successful at it. So I think that's the first piece is finding someone who is a masterful expert at what they do. Um, and I also think the second piece is uh, making sure that you find a business coach who is a true business coach. Uh, I find that there's a lot of people out there who are trying to get business owners to be like them. So for example, like they're trying to get them to model their model and that, that doesn't work for everyone. I know for me, um, I have a, I grew up, my father sold this company in, in college. I grew up learning about businesses. I went and got my MBA. Um, I know how to look at a revenue sheet and a business model. I know how to take into account people's desires and their interests. And so I'm looking at what's the best business model for them, taking into account the money they better make, the lifestyle they want to have. And I'm not looking at them and saying, okay, I want you to be like me. And I think that's where people have to be careful because you can get caught in a in a in a in a trap where you're having somebody who is trying to uh, to get you to be a certain model that you don't want to be or that you're not ready for. So, um, really finding a coach that is willing to um, to look at you for what you are is also important. That's and great. then also. Just a, you know, it's interesting because even I, like I have a business coach every year for myself and I've worked with the same one for a number of years. And then when I'm looking for one, I find it interesting how many coaches uh, don't allow you to speak to the actual coach who you're going to be working with um, yeah. until you've hired them, which I think is an interesting model. So it's, it's also important that you get a chance to speak to the coach that you want to work with. Uh, it. If you can, some coaches don't allow that. Maybe that's just the way their companies are set up. Um, but I know that for me, it's always made me more comfortable myself when I'm hiring someone to actually be able to speak with the coach that I'm hiring. I know that's what we do over here. And that way you can use your intuition about how you're feeling about that person and, and how the conversation goes as well. And then one other piece that I think is important when you're thinking about hiring a coach um, and I think this is not always common sense. Uh, the very first time I hired uh, a business coach that she's somebody that I actually ended up working with for over six years. I hired her because she was challenging me, not because I thought we were going to be best friends. And so you, depending on who you are, um, my guess is that you're somebody that wants to grow and learn and discover things. Uh, I think sometimes that people are looking for business coaches that are that they really like that they're going to be best friends with and while that's great it what you really want is somebody that's going to push you out of your comfort zone um, and challenge you to do things that you don't want to do or that you're uncomfortable doing, you know, obviously within your integrity and staying within your own value system sure. <laughs> but um, and that me that you're going to be best friends with your coach. No, it, it probably means, means you probably coach. won't be, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> At least not yeah. out of the gate. Yeah, right. Yeah. I always say that my clients have a love-hate relationship with me. Like they Makes love sense. me when they're having successes um, and they hate me when I'm challenging them to do more. And that's kind of how I like it to be. <laughs> yeah, no, I would like, imagine that's that, a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. That you bring a certain level of accountability to the to the coaching relationship, right? Where yeah. you're setting certain, uh, you know, things in place and your client needs to achieve those kind of things so you can help them be successful, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and that's the piece where um, it's not an easy thing, you know, to, to develop. Yeah. Like get into this relationship, but you want to just, you want to respect your coach. You don't have to like them. <laughs> I like that. That's a, that, there's, there's the, yeah, that's, that's a nice little quote there. Hey, I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor today, which is the alternative board at the alternative board.com slash SBS. We all know that owning a business is super rewarding, but it can also be really lonely and stressful. Even if you have employees, like those aren't your peers. You can't commiserate with them and get advice from them necessarily. And if you don't have anybody to consult with, it's hard to know if you're making the right decisions. This is part of why Shannon and I talk to each other, right? It's how this show that's, started. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why you need the alternative board, or as they like to call it, TAB, a group of business owners and experts in your area 
that you can turn to for advice. And Tab's been doing this for close to 30 years, helping owners and CEOs of, you know, privately held businesses, small companies, et cetera, with their business owner advisory need. Uh, each board is made up of up to 10 local non-competing business leaders. So you're not worried about, you know, showing up and kvetching about your problems to a competitor or anything like that. No problem. And you meet together for four hours a month and you discuss your business issues, your opportunities, you get feedback and support, and you get some coaching too in between meetings, which is perfect for this episode. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, having a tab membership can make a huge difference for your business. Members that are part of it report better work life balance, uh, greater ability to deal with day to day operations. Plus, a tab survey showed that their members surpassed the average sales revenues of privately held businesses by two and a half times. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, I, I believe in this concept. I really I this is a great thing. Uh, yeah, we've it, talked about it. On yeah, the show, you know, having times. a board, a, a groups around you that you can get support with. And uh, I, I think it's, it's critically important. And it certainly helped me. So you got to check this out. Go to the alternative board dot com slash SBS. That's the alternative board dot com slash SBS. And you can get uh, an ebook. 25 timeless principles of exceptional businesses. Normally it's $16.95, but small business show listeners get it for free. Again, that's the alternative board.com slash SBS. And our thanks to tab the alternative board for sponsoring this episode. Awesome. So, uh, I have another one, another question for you about revenue breakthrough. When you first got started and you started to see some success, uh, what surprised you the most? And, and what I mean by that, are there common problems that you saw that, that needed to be solved with your, your customers or is every situation unique? I would say that every business and every human is unique. However, there are some places where we all kind of do the same thing. <laughs> and sure. what I noticed is it all stems from, you know, we get into business to make money. And the interesting about this money situation is that we're not trained to talk about money at all, ever in our whole lives. Like if you're growing up and at the dinner table and you're like, how much does mommy make? Or how much does daddy make? Or how much should we pay for that car? You're liable to get into trouble for asking questions like that. And yet you move into entrepreneurship and it's like this huge bait and switch. Suddenly you are expected <laughs> to ask for money all the time, every day. Yeah. And you're supposed to be able to be comfortable talking about money. And I find that entrepreneurs of every kind, whether you're a solopreneur just starting or whether you're running a multiple seven figure company, we all have some discomfort or we around asking for money or talking about money or looking at our numbers or doing our bank statements or sending out our invoices um, unless you've already looked at that. And, and every time we hit a new ceiling around money, like you're starting to make more than you've ever made, new fears come up around, I'm not going to be able to make it, or I'm not making enough. Um, and really what that comes down to is that all of us have voices in our head around money. And those voices in our head are based on what we saw around money when we were growing up, what we heard around money when we were growing up or what we experienced around money when we were growing up. It's so, so true. It really yeah. affects yeah. everything that we're doing. Yeah. yeah I, it, I remember when my, my daughter started babysitting uh, the first, you know, she was going to, it wasn't her first job, maybe her fifth job. And I was like, Oh, what are they paying you per hour? She says, well, I don't know yet. And I had to point <laughs> out to her like, okay, I, I know that it feels awkward to ask about money, but, but put yeah. yourself in their shoes. Right. They need to know what they're going to pay you. So having that conversation up front long before you show up to take care of their kids actually makes everybody feel more relaxed. It seems weird, but trust me when I say as soon as you open the door, everybody's going to be a little more relaxed. But it is. You're right. It's a weird thing. It like gets into our heads and, and we've talked with our kids about money and it still got into their heads. So, yep. It's true. I, I mean, and, and, and you use that. That's such a great example of your daughter with doing it. And I find that, you know, I have entrepreneurs who have who have signed contracts to go into corporations and they don't know 
how much they're getting paid and when they're getting paid and <laughs> yeah. what what the rules are. You know, what what are the terms of this agreement that they're going into? Because they just were afraid to do it. And I also have clients who do sales conversations. And when they get to that ask point of how much it is, they start whispering, you know, or they're um, unclear yeah about, you know, the payment plan or when people are going to pay. And really, you know, this is, I I actually had, um, it it, it goes like in a lot of different ways. I had a multiple seven figure, she was making around $5 million person who stopped me. We were going to an event together and she's like, Monica, I have to talk to you. I have this horrible fear around money. And so we sat at the McDonald's to hash it out. And it turned out that she was terrified of making any more money because she was afraid that it was going to be taken away from her because as a child, all the money was taken away. Wow. So she had this horrible tendency to not save and to like spend it all because if she kept it, somebody would take it anyway. And this was all just sort of subconscious beliefs that were coming up. Yeah. It sounds like you spend a, a, a lot of time, you know, getting people comfortable with, you know, talking about money and also maybe comfortable with being successful because I think a lot of folks, you know, kind of undermine themselves along a similar lines, uh, you know, with money. Yeah, it it's true. I mean, because this belief that I'm talking about, you know, all the money, there are also underlying beliefs around sales, like the very asking of money and underlying beliefs around success as you, uh, as you put it And I've been doing this work now for over 15 years. And when you ask, like, what is the thing that everybody has in common? What I started to really learn in the first five years that I was doing this work is that I could teach about sales strategy and lead strategy and marketing strategy all day long. And if people And what I would notice is that we would come up with the sales strategy and then my clients would come to the calls and they would keep procrastinating around it or not quite doing it. And it was because we needed to get to the underlying fear first and be able to clear that fear in order for them to have the space to actually execute on like the actual strategies. And I find that over and over again at every level. Um, I work with a a venture capital firm who has pretty high level businesses and executive boards. And again and again, I find that if they're not doing something, a lot of us just assume if I'm not doing something, I'm like not disciplined or enough, or I'm not productive or great time management skills. But a lot of times I find that if people, if entrepreneurs aren't doing something, it's this sort of latent fear that's underneath the surface that we need to look at. Yeah, that's great. I I commend you for bringing that to the surface because I think all of us and we've had, you know, hundreds of other business owners on on the show, and there's a commonality there where people, you know, if they're really honest and transparent, they'll say, "Oh yeah, you know, I, I, we're afraid to do certain things," and so getting comfortable with that is, I think, really important. Um, so your website at, at revenuebreakthrough.com has a ton of great resources. I, I you know I spent some time up there, and one of the things I noticed. There's like an awesome five-part series, really in depth, on helping female entrepreneurs. And you know, can you talk about some of the unique challenges that that women face when creating businesses, being successful, uh, you know, and building wealth? Sure. Yeah. It's it's interesting because you know, and I'm not from the perspective of of women. I think men, we're, we both, like men and women have different challenges that are put upon them. Sure. And, and so I think. It's not necessarily unique to women, but there are unique challenges for women, meaning that generally, like I, we could also do this study with men and the pressure that's put on them to be providers. But one of the things that's interesting about women is, uh, you know, to be a successful business owner, it does um, mean that you have to become visible and in a lot of ways, courageous and powerful um, and step into leading at the forefront. And depending on one of the things that I wrote about in the article is depending on where your cultural background is, um, that can be looked down upon or and you can subconsciously fight it. So, for example, I am first generation. My parents came from India, so I'm first generation Indian. And in the Indian culture, as a woman, um, you're taught to be very nurturing and to be small, to not be large, like yeah. in your presence, in your stature. And so I remember that when I was doing my first live event, my first three-day live event, we were I was standing on the stage and my coach, 
who is an Indian, um, said, kept saying to me, Monica, own the stage, just own the stage, command the stage. And she just kept saying that. And my husband, who is Indian, looked at her and said, you know, she doesn't know how to do that. And wow. my coach was like, what? And he's like, she doesn't understand what, like those words, like own the stage, command the stage, they're not going to make any sense to her. Um, and he's like, because she's not culturally programmed to own or sure. command anything. And I, it was really wise of him to say that because, yeah. um, because it's true. Like we weren't communicating. Like she just kept saying, and like my, my translation of own the stage was like, walk faster. You know what I mean? Like I had no idea <laughs> yeah. what she was talking about. And then finally for me, um, it took the, tr- like what we were trying to get have me like be have resonance and presence on the stage and the way that I could translate that from my own background was um to realize that I'm an empath it's part of being a nurturer and for me to be open to feeling what the audience is feeling and then respond to that but not to necessarily command it but to respond to it now if you want to see stage you might say that it's commanding right you might choose to use that word but I choose to use the word responding because that goes better with who I am. And I think that it, the reason I say that is because as a woman, we all come from different cultural backgrounds and it doesn't even mean that you have to be an immigrant. Like you may right. come from a family where um, women were not were told that you could only be a teacher or a secretary or an artist, or you may come from a family where you weren't really heard, but your brothers were. Or you may come from a family where, you know, you can have a job as long as you get married and have children. And what's interesting is that we can openly say, oh, I'm against that or I don't want to go with that as women. And we do. But what we have to understand is that even if we are openly going against that, the effects of our vocabulary and who we are, it's going to show up in our business. So just being aware of how and where it's showing up. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I I really loved it, you know how you put it into context male and women you know unique challenges and and then the, your your example of being on stage is it's really powerful so it, it's a, it's a great resource we'll link to it uh, in the show notes here and uh, uh it's great to have all that information up on your on your site yeah and then just one other quick sure, thing that i sure. think is uh is a fun thing for women to just get to is a lot of us without even realizing it have the Prince Charming thing going. And what the Prince Charming thing is, is that we don't realize it, but we're waiting to be saved around money. And so what what tends to happen with this is the way that this might come up, if you're a woman, is that you aren't taking your numbers very seriously. Like you love doing what you're doing, but you're not necessarily in it to make money. And so therefore, you're struggling with money. You're tolerating living on less. Um, You may be depending on uh, a husband or family or boyfriend, or you may just be like slightly angry that the money's not coming. And partially it's because you're waiting to be saved. Um, And it's not true for every woman, but it's something to just examine about yourself. Like I know when I was asked, in in a great way to to pull this out of you is to like do some journaling and to ask yourself the question, who am I waiting for in order to make, before I make real money or before I make huge amounts of money? And when I did that question, I realized without even realizing it, that consciously like I still was depending on my father to like help me make money or to give me money. Um, and it, it, it took me a moment to really get that. Oh, like I, that I don't have to do that. And I can actually stand on my own two feet and I can make this happen. Um, so that's also just something to be aware of as women, especially if you've got, um, an unexpressed anger that, that you aren't making more, that more money isn't in your life. Like usually that's due to the fact that you're wondering why someone else hasn't created it for you. Wow, that's fascinating. It, it, it makes that's sense. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It is. It's so much of this seems like, uh, you know, you're helping people on this journey, kind of self discovery, right? Of really yeah. looking at the core of what's causing these actions or inactions, if you will, uh, with their lack of of revenue. Yeah, yeah, and and then and then getting to the actions for sure. But what I yeah. find is that if we can get to the beliefs and the fears, we we clear the path to make the actions a lot easier. 
Yeah. When you first started and you know, you've been doing this 15 years, I mean, what, what did it take you? I imagine it took you a while to kind of get this figured out <laughs> that you had to start really deep before you get out to, you know, to the, what you want. It's true. I, and, and I often actually think it works the other way around. In other words, like I believe the most important thing we can do in our businesses is ask for money over and over and over again. Because the thing that's going to create more money in your bank account, the number one way to move money in your bank account is sales. But what's interesting is that sales and moving money into your bank account is going to for certain bring up all your stuff. Uh So it's so so it's really it's um, as I really helped people to become more successful, I noticed that all this stuff came up in the process of getting there. It often doesn't work the other way, meaning like if you're theoretically looking at all of your fears, but you're not taking the actions, um, often, you know, that way of doing things is a much slower process um, and you don't get as far. Oh, that's that's great. That's good to know. So, okay, let's talk about marketing for a minute. How how do you find new clients uh, for Revenue Breakthrough? And, you know, what have you found that works the best or or in an example, maybe something that that didn't work well for you guys? Sure. So, I'm just going to, so flat out for those that are listening, I found that, you know, I run a service business and and, um, I have found even for product businesses that the one of the best ways to market yourself and to get high quality leads that want to work with you is by speaking. Oh. And so and 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 I and live speaking, doing talks in front of people where you're eyeball to eye, um, hosting your own events, uh, and also going for other people's events. And the reason for that is because we're in a we're in a sea of internet marketing right now and a sea of emails. And I find that to this day, the tried and true speaking is what um, ends up bringing the highest quality leads and leads that are very easy to convert because they're already in love with you. And at Revenue Breakthrough, I do quite a bit of speaking. Like I, um, I speak all over the country. I host my own live events. Um, and that ends up being for us not only the way that we get so much of our business, but also the way that I create raving fans because I'm able to distinguish, to find the people that are really good fits for me because they're able to like meet me, gauge my energy, um, listen to my teaching. And it ends up then that so many of our clients stay with us for like three or four or five years. That makes a lot of sense. Because of it. And then I would say the secondary a way that we get a lot of our clients that I also recommend other people get clients is through sponsorships. Again, it's another offline live uh, uh, thing where you're actually going to events, you're buying a table or you're buying a speaking spot. And again, you're talking to people, you're meeting that are within your target market. Um, And we do a lot of sponsorships that way as well. And then the third piece uh, that I recommend and that I also use at Revenue Breakthrough, and this is an online piece, is webinars. Um, And again, part of this is all based in uh, visibility marketing and education marketing, essentially letting people know who you are and educating them about something that is really important. Um, And so speaking does that, sponsorships do, do that, webinars also provide that, which allow for people to really self select meaning they decide based on what they hear after you educating them about whether you'd be a good fit for them. Um, And the only caveat with webinars that I would share is that it does, for webinars to really work, you do need an online email list of at least a thousand people. I see that you can recruit into the webinar from that. Exactly. That you can recruit into the webinar and, you know, doing things, it's always about, um, how how visible can you be, um, and how much can you can you teach people an offer that is going to have them be inspired by you, and then also making offers like making sales offers that allow people to sign up for conversations with you as well. That's great, and and you're, I mean, I, I get that you're adding value up front, right? You're giving them something, the the talk, the webinar, uh, you know, the, something that, that they're going to connect with and then moving them into your your paid programs, right? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And, and, and for us, a lot of that happens through conversations. Um, sure. And then people move through, uh, are, you know, are inspired and educated and then move through various programs. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great advice. Um, so the other thing I really liked on your site is, is you really talk so much about planning uh, and, you know, throughout your website. T- talk about the, the marketing calendar, uh, talking about adding value to uh, people. Tell, tell us what that is and, and how you've used it uh, in your business. The, what I love to talk about with planning, one of the aspects is what I call the 90 day rule. And the 90 day rule states that like, if it, let's say the month is April and you're experiencing a dip in your revenue, a low in your revenue. If I were to look at your marketing activities and your lead generating, my I would guess that what happened was 90 days before April, so say you know January, February, you didn't do as much lead generating as you needed to be doing to make sure that you have leads coming in in April. And the same is true for 90 days from now, which is that anything that you're doing now, whether it be speaking or sponsorships or webinars or um, being present on podcasts or doing videos where you're really putting yourself out there, all of that is going to develop over the next 90 days. And so we, we, what we have to do as entrepreneurs is start looking at what is our marketing calendar? What, what activities are we doing to make sure that leads are coming in six to 12 months from now, not just what's happening in this month. So I've created a resource to help people with this is what activities should I be doing? How often should I be doing them? How do I plan this out? And I've created a money making what we call our money making marketing calendar. It's it gives you an example of the revenue generating activities you should be doing. There's a blank version so you can fill it in for yourself and it explains all the activities for you. Um, And you can pick that up at revenuebreakthrough.com front slash marketing calendar, revenuebreakthrough.com front slash marketing calendar. That's great. So one of the things we ask everybody that comes on the show is to talk about mistakes because we, well, maybe because I've made so many, but uh, a a lot of it is, you know, we learn so much uh, from these mistakes. And so it's tradition here to ask everybody what the best mistake is that you think you've made? What mistake taught you the most, uh, you know, during your career? And would avoiding that mistake be kind of the best piece of advice you'd give uh, other small business owners? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I, you know, it's it's funny because I'm at a point in my business because I've been doing it for so long that I've trained myself out of thinking in terms of mistakes and successes. <laughs> that's good. That's yeah, smart. Um, yeah, yeah. That's powerful. <laughs> like uh, because you have to, you know, yeah. at some point, you really start to get, you know, I have the privilege in business school and being around my father of being around a lot of really successful entrepreneurs as I was growing up and as I was starting my company. And one of the things that they all have in common is that they're like, they're delusional. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, what, and what I yes. mean is that like, they don't even recognize something that hasn't worked. Like they, yep. they do not even talk about it as a mistake. So I think uh, for me, it's a that's a valid answer. You don't have to yeah. dig for yeah. anything because uh, we love that here. I mean, we preach yeah. it all the time. Uh, I would say that, yeah, I think after years of experiencing disappointments and like in and for me, what I I'm a I'm a results oriented person. We do more than 30 events a year. I always have goals into going into everything that I do. We do multiple launches per year, like we're and we don't always make them. And so my relationship with disappointment and not hitting a goal is as strong as my relationship to hitting our goals. <laughs> nice. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so I think what's, I think the learning that I would take from it for any beginning entrepreneur is to understand that the more that you do statistically, the more you will fail. So therefore, if you want to be more successful, it means that you're going to do more. It means you're going to be risking more, which means that you have to get more and more comfortable with failure. And so if you find that you're someone out there and you're like, gosh, this keeps, you know, things keep not working, that's actually probably a good sign. Because if things keep not working, then it means that you're trying a lot of things. Uh, Now, don't get me wrong. You probably want to make sure that you get some help and some guidance so that you know what to, you know, what to do along the way. But I think there's also something to be said of saying, you know what, like if you're going to be successful, you're going to risk a lot. And if you're going to risk a lot, you're going to fail a lot. 
Yeah, that that could be the best answer we've ever had. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I really like, think so. What you just said, the more you do, the more you will fail. Like what a powerful yeah. piece of information that is for to give to someone really at any stage of entrepreneurship or at any stage of life. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it's really that good. That is awesome. Yeah. I mean, for, awesome. And, 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 you know, I came up with that because of the number of weekends I spent in heartfelt, stomach felt disappointment. Yep. Literally, like I would do something, it wouldn't work. I would spend the whole weekend obsessing over it. It would invade my life, invade my relationship with my husband. My animals knew about it. You know, like it was <laughs> yeah. sad. And then I finally started doing statistical analysis because I'm an analytical girl. And I was like, Monica, how many times are you, do you do something that you have an expectation? And I just realized like statistically, I am doing more than the average person. So therefore there's going to be more disappointments. And I honestly think that that is true for so many entrepreneurs. Yeah, that yeah. is fantastic. That's for really sure. Great. So, you know, this is all this information is really great. I'm looking forward to listening to the show again uh, and picking that up. So we've got thousands of small business owners that are listening right now. Um, what would you like them to remember about you and Revenue Breakthrough when they're done listening to the show today? I think that, so I think that there is a money crisis out there with entrepreneurs that not everybody's talking about. And that crisis is that uh, we're not making enough money. We're not putting things away for savings. And so underlying the success, there's often fear and so the message that I want to put out there is that you can actually, no matter if you're an entrepreneur who's making great money, but you don't have time, you can create more time. If you're an entrepreneur who isn't making great money, but you'd like to, you can create great money. Um, and it's just about learning the steps to do so. So there is a path to it. Uh, and I, and so if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, there's no hope and I don't know what to do next, like I'd really encourage you to get some help to get there. Um, to figure out how to create that time or to figure out how to create that money. And if, um, and if, you know, and to reach out to us or to reach out to, to another business coach, to reach out, to know that there is hope um, and it's possible for you to have everything that you want. Cause I've seen it happen over and over again. That's a great, it's a great message and it is really powerful. And, you know, I, I, I want to thank you for coming on today, sharing your, you know, your journey, the things you've learned, uh, you know, what, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and, and to uh, learn more about Revenue Breakthrough? Well, I think the first thing is pick up the marketing calendar at revenuebreakthrough.com front slash marketing calendar. And if you want to connect with us directly, please email us support at revenuebreakthrough.com. And then you can also follow us um, on Facebook and Instagram. If you just look up Revenue Breakthrough, you can join um, our group and follow us on Instagram. I do a lot of uh, great videos, great information on, on those channels as well. That's fantastic. Thank you again for coming. Uh, I've, I, once again, I always say, you know, I've learned the most here. And uh, I know Dave and I, you know, really appreciate you taking the time out to share everything with us. It's Thank great. you so much. It's, this is awesome. Really, yeah. really some great advice. And, and it's a great thing you're doing, too. This is awesome. So thanks for coming on the show, Monica. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Keep living that charmed life. 